Aloha. You guys, welcome to another Dose of Positivity. I'm so excited to see so many of you in the house live. And those of you who are on the Facebook page or LinkedIn, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please drop your thoughts, your comments, your questions in. We're going to be having a really terrific show with my special guest. And Barbara, have, I know you're off mic. How, how do I say your last name so I don't bastardize it? That would be great. Shower. Shower. Barbara mm-hmm. Shower. I love it. So, um, Anyway, I know her, her her better than her last name, and most of you know me, I'm dyslexic, and I have stumbled over words before, but that does not stop me from um, moving forward with great love and a yoga mindset to have the confidence to show up every Thursday to do a dose of positivity. And I want to welcome all the newcomers here to the show and remind you, if you haven't already dropped your email, um, are getting our email emails uh, we do a daily dose of positivity where I put out a beautiful uh, nature photography and a quote from myself or someone like Emerson or Thoreau or Emily Dickinson. You know, just do wow, positive way to start your day. And you can open it or just say not for me today. So um, please, uh, all you newcomers, drop your email and you'll be glad you did. Every Friday we drop an incredibly healthy recipe and then on um, we, we also send out a newsletter to keep you posted of all the terrific guests. We have a lineup, an amazing, amazing guest coming um, this spring. So again, thanks for joining us, everybody. And um, before we get started with Barbara Schauer, um, who is my yoga teacher when I go to Asheville, North Carolina, not only is she my yoga instructor, we're going to talk about, well, what does that mean? Uh, not just asanas, right? But Barbara also is, you, you know, when you watch her in class, and, and the reason I asked her to be on a guest is, I mean, she is one of the most positive people I know who's come from one of the darkest places I know. And you can't help but look at this woman and smile. So um, I hope her smile is as contagious for you as it is for me. And uh, while people are coming in and joining in the room, as always, I'm going to read from one of my books. And, um, and, and before I do that, too, we're going to drop right in the link in the very beginning here. Um, I want you all to just do me an extra favor during this dose of positivity and pray for Tell. Most of you have been on here. No tell who's been working, and she actually. This is our, I think, our 90th show, maybe our 91st show. And tell um, has shown up for every show except for the last five or so because she has been very ill and she's in China getting a chemotherapy treatment that is really she's fighting for her life right now. And we're going to pop in the link to the GoFundMe. I want to thank everybody so far who's generously donated, whether it's $10 or $100, whatever you can do to help bring Tell home alive and back on the show. But meanwhile, while in the house, we have Shane, who is Tell's sister-in-law, who rocks my world, who's helping me with all these things. And of course, TJ, who is the person who's responsible for making sure all the technical stuff goes on and who does all the replays for the show. And I want to thank you gals for showing up each and every week um, for doing these shows. So I'm going to read something really, really brief, and then we're going to dive into this mindset and to this beautiful world of what yoga is. And halfway into it, we are going to be doing some chair yoga with Barbara, who's going to light up your world and fire up your body and also prepare you if you're on the East Coast for a more restful, peaceful sleep, because yoga can help us with all of those things. So first, I'm going to read you this very short passage from this woman called Shai Waling. And she is a Buddhist monk. And um, she wrote this beautiful poem called Path to Peace. It's right livelihood is reflecting our loving kindness and compassion. In the way we earn our living. It is nurturing and caring for others with our work. And that is the most appropriate thing for the show because that is where we're heading with this conversation with Barbara with how she found exactly 
this right livelihood in reflecting our loving kindness and compassion in the way we earn our living with her yoga studio that she has in Woodverville, North Carolina, which is shedding a ripple effect throughout the community of kindness, love, and compassion. And that's here what we do here at A Dose of Positivity. And I probably won't read it now because, uh, well, you know what? We do have time and people are just coming in the room right now. So I'm just going to read you one paragraph too from, from the book. But that, that poem kind of sets the stage for where we're heading with this. You know, a lot of times we talk about entrepreneurship on the show as well and using our livelihood and our who we are, what we love to do, and what is our purposeful why, why to make a difference in the world. And um, one way is starting your own yoga studio at 40 years old. <laughs> anyway, and Barbara's now in her late 60s. So. so I don't know, most of you guys don't know this about me, but I've been doing yoga since um, my late teens. And when I was in my mid-20s, I uh, went to, when I was not in the wintertime, taking a respite from my uh bakery cafe I would go to the Bahamas to this yoga ashram and my mom was really sick and I'm just going to read this to you because I think it's really powerful I start out with this quote holding on is not always a sign of strength there are times when it takes more strength and courage to accept and to let go love is more potent than anything and it outlives death, unquote. Everything was alive and thriving except my mom who was dying. The doctors ran out of treatments to save her and she knew it. Before I went to Florida to visit my parents, I prepared my body and my mind and I returned to a yoga ashram in the Bahamas. During the winters, this relaxing place had been a refuge for me to recoup before visiting my folks in the winter. The tropical island was just a short flight away. Surrounded by supportive spiritual people in an idyllic setting, I reflected on the significant changes in my life. We meditated and chanted twice a day for hours in the open air temple, practicing yoga asanas between nutritious meals and enjoying an hour of beach time every day. Now, the reason I'm reading this to you, just to affirm that why I know how Barbara is such a special teacher, none of the teachers at this yoga ashram can even compare to Barbara's teaching and kindness, but also to realize that um, yoga can change your life no matter what age you're at. And I would love to welcome all of you who have experience with yoga to open up and express your experiences with it. I know Erin, if you're on, or if Erin comes on, uh, it got her through total grief, but also giving yourself the gift of time, whether it's chair yoga at home or going on a retreat, um, you can bring yoga with you wherever you go. But Barbara Shower is basically the least likely person to become a yoga teacher. And I'm going to read you a short bio. She was born in New York and married early, leading a life that took her in various places. She completely disconnected from her body until her 30s, where she encountered her yoga teacher during this time. Bar Barbara had been struggling with anxiety and depression but was transformed by the example and yoga practice of her teacher. Inspired by her own journey, she became a teacher herself, and she aims to provide and continues to provide others with the same transformational experience as she has. And trust me, I only took maybe six classes from this woman, and she transformed my life once again and got me back excited to yoga. So Barbara, with that introduction, I would like to welcome you to A Dose of Positivity. And um, come off mute and come off and show your beautiful smile to everyone. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Donna, can you see me? Yeah, I think so. Great. Yeah. 
Thank you. You wrote a better bio of me than I have on my website for the yoga studio. I'm going to steal what you just wrote because it's just wonderful. It really hits all the high spots and makes it very relatable too, because many, many people, I think especially women, have a real challenge feeling at ease and at home in the human body, in the world. And when I was a kid, um, I was totally dissociated from being in the body. I did not enjoy it. I didn't like the body I got. I didn't think it looked very good. I wasn't sporty. Um, I tended to be intellectual. I thought of my body as just a machine, a thing that got me to the library, to school, where I could do the things that were um, most, I don't know, conducive to my happiness, which was being a good student, but not being um, a person embodied like others. And uh, it really took a long time for me to accept the terms of being in the world as a person, that it includes this kind of incarnation. You've got to be in this like suit. And um, I, I struggled a lot with my emotions. Um, I don't think I had a way to really steady them or look at them objectively. And so I was really at their mercy. And uh, it was at a class with my teacher, Anna Costa, who's in Encinitas. She's originally from Rio de Janeiro. And she has a beautiful Brazilian accent. And um, I didn't especially want to go there. Um, I was busy doing other things in my life. And my daughter actually said, you know, this gym that I go to, because that's where Anna was teaching. She was teaching in a gym in Cardiff. There are yoga teachers there. And there's one that's really good. You should go and meet her. And it's resisting, like, no, no, I don't need another mm -hmm. thing in my life. And they finally did meet her. And she was charming. And she's got this wonderful, serious, but bubbly kind of um, aspect to her. She's very, very um, attractive as a person, just charming. And like I, you. Sorry, I had to so go there. It in. also has a lot to do with, with my spirituality, actually, um, not dwelling on kind of the, the worst case scenarios, that it actually became a kind of um, a spiritual, um, impelling, uh, um, directive in my life to make sure to figure out how not to lose that fight, how to actually just hold on to the happiness and cultivate it and amplify it. And I can talk about that later, but I want to say I walked into one of Anna's classes early on in my acquaintance with her and I could feel um, an, a depression building up it was i would actually even have dreams of like tidal waves and it was just this kind of massive overwhelming wall of solid emotional stuff that i couldn't couldn't work with and it would show up as depressions in my life and there was a day i went in and i knew it was coming and i would lose weeks months years to um kind of making my way through it and Anna um, was just leading us through her usual flow. And her flow, like uh, Ashtanga, which also comes from Encinitas, Anna's flow is pretty set. You you show up for whether it's her, her dynamic or her gentle Anahata class, and it will be pretty much the same postures each time you come, which is kind of interesting and wonderful because um, it's 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 reflective of you. You you go into the same pose and it's not going to change so that you're catching up to it. It's right there like a mirror and you can see yourself and it's a very compassionate mirror. So I like the way she teaches. She was leading us into a forward fold, just bending over. Um, and I could hear her voice as we were in that pose. And she was saying this pose, Uttanasana, releases anxiety it softens stress, it clears your mind. And it was all the things that I was um, just about to lose out to. She was naming them, just going down the list. And I could feel it slide off. I could actually almost hear it hit the ground. And when I stood up, it was gone. And it wasn't like I thought a better thought or I finally, um, you know, came to terms with it in some way where I had control of that mental and emotional um, part of myself. I literally stood up and I knew that 
and this teaching and that pose and yoga um, had a power that could change lives. When I stood up, the only thought I could think was, I want this for everybody. Um, and it's not like every time anybody goes into Uttanasana, they're going to have exactly that experience. But I knew that when people do go into a forward fold, they have a chance in their own way to unload stuff, not just to fold over and get good at like reaching the ground, but to actually let stuff fall out and <laughs> be absorbed by the earth. It was um, a real surprise to me. I wasn't really sure exactly what yoga was, but um, that made me want to carry it out to other people. And it happened that at that time, which was like the year 2000, 2001, Anna was beginning to teach people to teach Anahata yoga. And I just was one of the first on board, like, show me what you're doing because I want this to go out to other people. Even when I was taking her class, knowing it was a teacher training, at first I thought, I'll just get really good at yoga. And then I thought, no, I'm going to learn to actually teach this because people need it. This is really what they need. They don't know it exists yet, but they actually need this. So um, that was where that was where yoga got me. It just <laughs> it came in and took me. So um, well, I've been I doing just, it. This is so great. I want to ask you something before I, because I, I before it slips my mind. Okay, so this is yeah. 20, 23 years ago. And, and how old yeah. are you 23 years ago? How old was I? Yeah. Uh, I was like 49 years old. Okay. So I know some of the people on here are younger. And I know Meredith, who's on here, it actually went, in, and I think she got certified in, in yoga, and she's young, and now she's off doing something else. I want everybody who's listening to this to realize, I mean, and that's why I read that livelihood poem at the beginning, is, is, is like, you never know when it's going to, when these, these surges are going to happen and when these gifts are going to come to you, and, and just to hold that in your heart when something like that, a moment like that, can totally change your life, and I just am so in awe um, that you did that at that time in your life. What, what were you doing before yoga besides being a student and intellectually uh, loving the library? Oh. Versus... <laughs> I was married. I was a mother to three children who um, were each born in a different decade. So um, I was like constantly going over the same ground with the next person and the next person. I had one in the seventies, one in the eighties, one in the nineties. It was not a plan. It just happened yeah. that way. So I was doing that a lot. And um, my training is actually in fine art. So I was painting and um, um, making art and that kind of thing, um, which I miss a lot. It just seems to be, you know, hard to do right now because where yoga led me was to having a yoga studio here in Asheville in North Carolina, or actually in Weaverville on the edge of Asheville. And um, having a yoga studio of your own is not to be taken lightly. It really, um, it, it just has tendrils. It goes into every part of your life there. And even your relationships. I was really amazed looking back, thinking that I couldn't have done on my own, but people were, um, just intrigued enough by it and sympathetic enough to what I was trying to do that I've always been able to say, and I need help with like technology and I need help with, this is a business and I've never done a business. And it would just like pull people in. I really feel sorry for them, but they seem to be doing it <laughs> their own free will. But, you know, it's just, um, it, it, it touches on everything. If you wanted to actually like be friends with me at this point, you would have to have something to do with the yoga studio. Right. I have friends outside it, but most of them are like, come on, let's do this thing. Let's do this great work together. We're going to help people. Yeah, that is so great. Well, I I'm so glad you, you did that. But one, one thing real quick, I want to acknowledge Alan is in the house. And I, I, Alan, we have missed you so much. And uh, meet Barbara. Alan, Alan's a regular on the show. Just a, uh, We haven't seen you hey, in months. And I'm so glad you're here, Alan. Um, so, you know, your, your yoga studio, I, I just want people to realize is probably one of the most arty, beautiful studios I've seen. So Barbara, I want you to realize you are making that, you are turning that, um, place into an art, um, uh, what you're doing. And, and one of the things I, I wanted 
talk about too, um, real real quick, is you just had a trip to India, and yeah. I just came back from India too. We we crossed like I was in India for a month, and then and then Barbara left, and she went for a month, and she just got returned. Tell us what you were doing there, and 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 why why you went. I went on pilgrimage. Um, since I was 21 years old, when I was 21 years old, I first heard about Meher Baba. And um, he is, uh, is was a uh, um, person who lived in India, who um, the first thing that I heard about him was that he said he was the avatar and that all you needed to do was love him. And when I heard that, it just rang a bell. It was just like, I know that. I know that to be true. And I have been following and loving him ever since I first heard his name. He is. He lived in uh, Meherazad, which is to the north of Ahmednagar. You wouldn't even know Ahmednagar. It's inland from Bombay and Pune. Um, and he lived in one place and he's buried his samadhi, his tomb is about 15 miles away. And between those two places, I spent a month in India in February with my husband, Jay, and some friends who um, also um, have this as part of their lives, just um, trying to trying to remember um, love, grow closer to him, even by doing something um, as uncomfortable as a trip to India. Um, just, you know, any way that uh, and it's one of the reasons why I think you experienced me as smiling. He is the one who said, don't worry, be happy, which when I first heard it, I thought was just so such a like preformed cliche. Like, how could anybody say something more obvious? But if you actually try to do it, try not to worry and make a point of trying to get a hold on what it is to be happy, um, just looking for it and trying to um make that more real in your life than your own personal quandaries. Um, it, I think, I think it affects people. Most of the people I know who love Meher Baba um, take that order very seriously. And he said it a number of times. He said, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. And sometimes he would say, I will help you. And occasionally he would throw in, even if you don't want it. Oh, so I love that. That's great. Well, here you are is passing that word. And I thought it was really interesting that when you mentioned him and started talking about that, um, Buddy, my dog, who makes me so happy, like, yes. I, I'm a real believer in, and I know Christine will agree with this, you know, like the life beings and other, and other beings. I mean, I think he just came here to bless us all through, through my dog which is dog spelled backward is God and, 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 and shed some, some love and light. And I think if we're open to all of that stuff, we live a happier life. And one of the things I, I didn't know, like that, there's that song, which I love, don't worry, be happy. Um, yes. TJ, if you can find that, pop that in the chat. And I Bobby McFerrin. And Bobby he saw McFerrin. a poster of Meher Baba, a very famous picture. Okay. And it just had the words under it. Don't worry, be happy. And when he saw those words, it struck him. And okay. um, he composed the song based on just having that glancing experience of seeing those words. That is so profound for me to hear that, to understand, to, to make that full circle of that story. Because I love that song. And, and I always go around saying I'm the happiest person I know. Hi, Erin. Welcome to the show. We're so glad you're here. You're going to love Barbie. Erin is an incredible yogi herself. She did a show. Hey with us and she um, does these beautiful yoga retreats and, and we'll pop in, Aaron, feel free to pop in your link to your uh, retreat, honey. Um, but yeah, wherever you go and, and in a few minutes, uh, Barbara's gonna be doing some chair yoga with us. Um, and we don't have to go to India or to South America or uh, even have uh, a teacher. There's two other links I'm gonna have put in, the, in there because I want you guys to have time to take take these the chat down well three actually put in my blog um from this week it's a really good blog about yoga and also um we're going to put an inside timer and then the link to barbara's studio in, in weaverville they they record all the the, sh the shows and, and it's super inexpensive i'm not trying to sell anything and i'll get a commission but you you can have a class with barbara if you like it so we're gonna we're gonna put that um 
also in, in the chat there, those three links. So, um, but, uh, and, and also Aaron, the link to your, to your show. So, and I want to welcome all the new people in live. You'll, you can catch the replay. We'll be able to catch the replay on those who've missed it beginning because this was a really good story so far yeah, on YouTube or on, on our, um, our podcast channel. So you'll all get that link here. Um, if you give us your email, if you haven't already, we'll keep you up to date. So, um, yeah, there, there's before before you do the chair yoga, I, I wanted to to talk about why I love Mahababa. I want to make sure we get that spelling right. And, 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 and we also want to make sure everybody has that link, including me, because I, I, I now I want to geek out this this beautiful human that came through my dog um, <laughs> so, or, you know, <laughs> that's still with us here. But I also wanted to talk about the these malas that you and I are both wearing right now because um, tell tell us about about them and the symbolism behind them and how how they how they became to be so powerful. Would you say that again, Donna? Oh, I'm I want I am I am I c c cutting out? Um, talk talk about the malas and what they symbolize and how they how they became such an important thing and people still use them today. They've been around for thousands of years. So t talk about them in regards to Malas yoga. are um, a strand of beads and there are shorter ones that can fit around your wrist. The traditional one is 108 beads and it's got a sort of an extra bead where you turn around once you finished um, going in one direction, you flip and go in the other direction. Um, they're made um, oftentimes of stone or wood. This is um, Rudraksha beads, and then these are sandalwood, and you've got rosewood. But um, the thing is, 108 is a very holy number in, in the East, in India. Um, it's a number of completion. It's a very mystical number. And so there are 108 beads on a mala. And what you do with a mala is um, you have a mantra that um, generally is a holy word, one of the names of God, or a mantra that your your teacher gave you that's, that's kind of signature of your soul, that type of thing. Um, and you, you recite that internally or even aloud quietly as you pass the, the beads through your fingers. So each time you say the words or the word, you pass another bead through your fingers. And so it sort of involves a little bit of simple, barely conscious effort in your body to run your hand over the beads and then flip it around. But um, the sound of mantra itself um, is the same as the thing that the mantra is describing. So if you're saying Buddha, if you're saying one of the names of the avatar of God and you're passing the mala through your hand at the same time as you're saying that word, the vibration of the word itself. I mean, this is very Indian and it's very, you know, um, um, entrenched in, in ancient thinking and, and understanding is that the sound is vibrational and everything is vibrational. Everything is either quicker or slower, but all vibrational. So when we teach yoga, for example, the body is solid. It's um, anamaya kosha, the bread body, the solid stuff that's the same as the substance of the earth, because the earth is basically the same as your body because you're eating food. You're eating food, it's from the ground, so that's your body. But then there are finer and more subtle um, koshas, these layers of the body, and sound vibration and especially the sound of a mantra of a holy vibration goes through your body it's just like ringing a bell just tiny little bells every cell every space between the cells responds to that sound and it's a purifying sound so the yogis also refer to the body as a field a kshetra and it's kind of like the the um, gospel where Jesus talks about throwing the mustard seed into the field and it grows and it produces great things. When we do things like yoga or mantra or meditation, we're doing something to the field of the mind and the body that actually um, with repetition, with discipline and with the practice makes it more and more um, 
rich and fertile so that good things can land on it and they grow. And that's the idea that you shouldn't just let it go to weeds, not your mind, not your body, but by um, uh, learning how to do these simple sort of um, inherited things from a teacher, from someone who can give it to you, um, you do you do something worthwhile with the human life you've been given that you become more receptive to um, what is good, what is holy, what is beautiful, because you've trained your mind and made your body more receptive and sensitive to it. So um, yoga does that. Yoga does that. Mantra and having a mala can just keep you on task with saying your mantra that if you were just trying to remember it, lots of things happen. Um, you know, you're driving your car or a door slams or something and suddenly you're not saying that anymore. But if you've got a mala in your hands, you might miss a beat, but you go right back to it when it's there. Um, so um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful part of the spiritual side of yoga, which is all spiritual, but it's just nice to know there are things that literally we have in our hands that can help us to live the kind of life we would hope to live that you know based in reality and truth and beauty i love that well one of the things um you said it that 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 i want to just get really clear with everybody on on the show and also clear with myself is the type of yoga that you do and there's also hatha yoga there's all kinds of like they say yoga and is that mostly referring to the asana or isn't it yoga just like a whole body mind spirit thing like because we're about to do some chair yoga right so what when when we say the word yoga i have a yoga studio like you also have peace ceremonies and mantras you do all kinds of things at your studio so really if you were to just in three or four sentences like really just define what is yoga <laughs> or 10 sentences yep. okay and then we're going to do yeah. some yoga yoga is a way of taking the stuff you've been given the body stuff and the mind stuff and making it into something that your heart desires, that you really do because you're a human being, you really do want that, that goodness in your life. And it's hard to achieve by, um, I don't know, uh, other means, but with yoga, we've been past this through, we've been given this through, you know what the Kundalini Yogi say, they say there's a golden chain and you're a link in that chain and your your duty as a human is to polish that link so that it holds really well and receives what came before and transmits it to those who come after because don't you say that also that something about the future being um uh that it matters yeah living the, like the future you know, they say it matters they say we're already part of it and by what we do in our lives now we determine um, that we're going to be basically a conduit to bring the gifts and the beauty thing, the beautiful things that we've received to the next people, to the next mm -hmm. ones to come along. Good. Well, I'm really glad you, you even brought up Kundalini yoga and Hathi. There's how many different kinds of yogas are there? And yeah. can, and it, are there five? Are there 10? I mean, when you, and the, why oh, did there's you, more. why did you choose the yoga that you, you, you chose? to do? I did two types of yoga when I lived in Encinitas. Uh, Encinitas is where Ashtanga yoga came into America. There were some surfer boys who ran into a guy in India and then they brought him over, kind of like Bill and Ted's Great Adventure. They brought Patabi Joyce over to Encinitas and had him live there and teach them. So that was one type that I studied because it's very um you know, grounded in, in Encinitas. That's, that's one of the, that's one of the gifts to the world um, is that Encinitas was, was the home of that. But my own teacher, Ana Costa, um, came across the teachings of Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda, who wrote copiously and who wrote a book that a lot of people read and passed around called The Autobiography of a Yogi, which is a charming book. And it really got people to open up their minds and begin to appreciate and put value on 
some of the um, uh, kind of spiritual riches of the East, which he describes. He describes having a teacher, having basically um, come upon his own teacher and what that did to him and the kind of effects that it had on his life and that it made him into somebody who wanted to, um, in turn, um, pass that along to others. And he, in particular, brought it to America. So he brought his particular type of Kriya meditation and things like that. My teacher, Anna, loved everything she read that he had written, and she decided to dedicate her life to the little um, enclave where he wrote that book and where several people who still follow him. It's it's a major center in Encinitas, the Self-Realization Fellowship, and they teach meditation and they live these very lovely, harmonious, disciplined lives. And Anna wanted to be part of that. So she gave up everything in Brazil. She sold her um, uh, graphic arts business. She did everything. This was like in the late 1990s and came to America, just threw herself into this. And after about a year, the people there said um, that they didn't feel she had what they would call a vocation. So she could go, she should go home. And she, they meant to Brazil. And she thought, no, <laughs> like, cut all my ties with it. I have nothing left there. So she was in a state of shock. And when Anna goes through hard things, she meditates even more and reads her teacher, Yogananda, even more. And she came across a quote that it is slow but sure suicide to sit, eat, walk, talk, lie down with a caved in chest so that the heart is starved and the spine becomes malformed. Mm. And when she read those words, she thought, that's everybody I see around me. And when I tell my students this, I say it's even before we were all like this, like hunched over like turtles looking at little tiny devices in her hands. And she knew that she couldn't just teach inside the little ashram, but she was going to have to get this out to the world. And that's why I encountered her. Otherwise, she would have been hidden away. But as it was, um, she created Anahata Yoga specifically to remind people that within them, they have this incredible, um, uh, vast treasure of the human heart and that they should remember that, know it, and do something about it. And you can do something about it through yoga. You can do poses, you can do breath, you can keep turning your attention to it and awakening your own heart center so that it becomes much more um, a home to you inside your own self. And all the yogis say that. They say that this is home. This is actually home. This heart, this anahata chakra is where the mind goes, when your body is quiet, when you've arranged things so that you're really um, in a peaceful state. Your mind just goes, oh, you don't need me watching out for problems. I'm going home to the heart. And you'll just feel it. We all know that feeling of just everything just being right, everything just being where it belongs. And that's why you work on your heart. And you can do it through yoga so that your mind has someplace identifiable to go and be at peace. I, I, I just love that. That was great. That's a good segue into doing the chair yoga. But before you do that... I would just, if you can re repeat that one more time, what she said about the heart opening and that was so beautiful. And this is what I love about you as a teacher. When you're in class, you drop all these golden nuggets and makes you realize, man, there's a lot more to yoga than just handstands and, and um, downward dog, you know? <laughs> yeah. So would you just say oh. that, can you say that one more time? I don't know that I can because I never know what I'm going to oh, say. That, that's okay. Saying. You were you were you were talking about what she said about opening the heart and um... yeah, opening the heart that it's actually a place, a, a a kind of energy and a hub of energy within you that we all sense is there, but we don't have words for it in the West. So thank goodness we encountered yoga and people could say, you know. This body comes with everything it needs and it's kind of stacked up like you've got a spinal column and we all know that we accept it. And they're saying from the bottom of that to the very top of it, you are amply supplied with what you need to live in the world and to do it 
well and to do it in a way that that pleases you and a way that you can even offer to whoever or whatever it is you pray to you have something to give by understanding the um the kind of i don't know the the availability of these remarkable things inside yourself that they're systematic just like leaves are systematic and trees i mean they grow in a certain way so do human beings it's systematic it can be described and when people especially the yogis began to realize that right. they realized you could tap into it and you could do things with it so that your life was better and so that the effect that you had on others was better so it's that it's awakening your heart it's actually realizing that it's a it's a harbor it's a safe place inside yourself and if you um, are conscious of it and um, and find a teacher like I did who can direct you toward it productively and say, you know, it's not just there. It's not inert. You can interact with your own heart and and make it stronger, brighter, better. You know, it's got it literally has light. It has light that glows when we do things for it. So oh, I love that you are my teacher when I'm in Nashville. And I love that you're teaching all of us here. Oh, someone needs to go on mute. Oh, hi. Can you go on mute, honey? Um, maybe you can help me, Shane. Um, or, or TJ. I think everybody's muted now. I think, okay. I think they're all. So, all right. Um, okay. So when Alan wrote something that's really great, and, and, and this is perfect leading us into doing a little chair yoga, Barbara, you ready? But he, he we were just like I was talking about the different um, people do, you know, different, all the different kinds of yoga, right? And, and it, he makes a really good point, you know, why are different people attracted to different sports, colors, exercises, etc. But really all paths arrive at the same end, theology, like love, like heart, right? So that's yeah. what we're talking about. So everybody, even whether you're sitting in your chair or, you, or you're able to do handstands on your own or backflips or whatever it is, let's take a few minutes. I want you to experience, um, Barbara, take us into some breath exercises and then allowing us uh, to take five, eight minutes out of our busy day and to give our spines and our body, mind, and spirit some love. Take it away, Barbara. Beautiful. So we can begin just wherever you are. And um, Deborah, are you actually driving or are you a passenger? Can you do yoga or? Okay. 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 Then um, you're already sitting. Um, most of us sit pretty dreadfully. Um, we sit slumping against the back of a chair and caving in, dropping the shoulders forward. So if you're in an actual chair, do yourself a big favor. Move forward away from the back of the chair. Don't let it touch you behind. Place your feet on the ground. Close your eyes. Rest your hands along your legs. And turn your awareness from the outside world and the things that happen there, inward. Feel this remarkable body. It is a robe of honor, an incredible gift, a gift to your soul to live in this body in the world. Lift your shoulders and then drop them down and back. Lengthen through the back of the neck, lift through the crown of your head and soften your face, your forehead, your eyelids and the tongue in your mouth. Notice the breath that you're breathing already, always breathing. This becomes a powerful tool, a friendly tool in our hands in yoga. So dropping the shoulders once more and lengthening the back neck, now begin to breathe deeply and slowly into and out of your nostrils, breathing in and breathing out. Breathing slowly to steady the mind. This kind of breath engages the mind, brings the mind into the body. Inhale to four through your nostrils and exhale to four from the nostrils. Inhale into your heart center, awaken, lift the heart, and exhale, soften, let the breath flow away. 
Inhale, bring the breath deep into the heart. Expand, lift. Exhale, soften your heart. Let it go. And once more, inhaling into your heart center. And exhaling, release. Resting your hands on your legs once more. Now turn your inner gaze upward to the point between the brows. You might touch it with the finger so that your external body and your mind agree. It's right there. Gana chakra, the mind center. So gazing upward toward that point. Inhale and exhale. Clearing, steadying. Bringing consciousness of the mind to your thoughts at this time. Bringing together the loving heart, the thinking mind. We have a breath, Nadi Shodhanam. It can be done in a variety of ways, but here's one. Turn the index and middle finger of the right hand down to the base of the thumb. Press the thumb against the right nostril, shutting it. Inhale up through the left nostril. When you have enough with your ring finger and thumb, shut both nostrils. Now lift the thumb, exhale on the right. Inhale, bring the breath up the right side. This is the mind side, hold. Lifting the ring finger, exhale through the left nostril and inhale all the way up, hold. Lifting the thumb, exhale, inhale. Pause the breath, relax your shoulders, lifting the ring finger, exhale, inhale, hold, and once more on the right, exhale, and inhale, hold. Now exhale from both nostrils, return to nostril breathing, relax and enjoy what happened. A shift of energy, a weaving together, of the hemispheres of the brain, of thinking and feeling. And quietly opening your eyes, open your hands nice and big, stretch those fingers and move them around. Then grip with your hands like you're squeezing things and stretch the fingers again. And grip really hard like you're squeezing lemons and open your hands, stretch the fingers. One more time, squeeze tight and open your hands. Loosen your fingers up and then pat the palms of your hands and listen to the sound. <laughs> Bend all the fingers in the half like your like their little cat claws now and then stretch them long. Bend them in the middle knuckles, even the thumbs and stretch them long. <laughs> Good. Bend them in the middle little cat claws and stretch them long. Then fan your hands wide and pull them together. Then fan them out wide. And pull them in together once more wide and together then relax your hands circle the wrists one way and then the other good shake out your hands shake them really hard like you are frothing lattes with your fingers so shake them shake them shake them loosen them up <laughs> good. and then open your palms and feel the tingle feel that sensation prana life energy moving through your hands now now we're all sitting at a computer right now, and a lot of us do more of this than anybody ever would have predicted. So if you get stuck there, you can help yourself still. You can lift the shoulders and roll them back. And lift them up and roll them back. And feel your shoulder blades moving behind you as you do this. Good. And then roll them one at a time. We're doing yoga. Pull them back and press down internally on the collarbones and feel your upper back squeezing together like you're holding a little lemon between your shoulder blades. Hold it, don't let it drop. So your upper back is now stable. Chin a little bit down, just turn your head slowly side to side. Face forward and sway your head without moving your shoulders very much. Keep those steady those out of it and just sway your head then drop your head forward and consider this a bow of the mind to the heart bring your ear over toward the right shoulder and drop your head bring the ear over toward the left shoulder and drop 
and then back and forth a few more times, go slow enough that you can really feel it. So it's not about getting it done. And it's not about what you might get if you get it done. It's actually about feeling it as you do it. So you can feel your collarbones, your neck, the muscles, the big muscles up and down the sides of the spine. Good. Then face forward once more. Breathe a deep breath. And bring your right arm up and over a little bit and feel your side open and breathe. Big sigh of relief on your right side. Reach. Breathe into the side. And you can actually even lean back a little bit and look up at the ceiling and then lean forward a little bit like you're shading yourself and then leaning back and lifting your face, looking up and feel what's happening in the side there mm -hmm. and lowering down, just leaning and looking at the floor and then looking forward, reach the arm up, lower down. Roll that shoulder, shake out that hand and just notice how it feels. So the left side, we'll just do this. We'll reach up and then reach over and you could have a straight arm you could droop the arm over your head. It's fine. However, it feels good to stretch your side. You're reaching a little, breathing. Remember, your breath is not just oxygen molecules. It's stuff that moves, that expands and contracts, that can open up space inside you if you use it voluminously. And then you can look down and sort of round that way. And then roll backwards, look up so you can feel your face lifting, looking down. And looking up again. And once more, looking down. You can feel this in your shoulder blade, maybe. And then look up at the ceiling and just feel the throat open, the face stretched. Reach up and lower the left arm and relax. Roll the shoulder, shake out your hands, and just pause for a breath and see how you are. So one more thing. It's just a little practice, but all of these things, if you develop hand and wrist issues from being at your computer a lot, it isn't there. It's actually up in your shoulders and your neck. It's much higher up. It's that, yeah, that we're all kind of caving in forward and shutting off circulation. So it's really important to keep your chest open, to even bring your arms up like wings, press them out, bring them forward, that kind of thing. And anything you can feel moving means that circulation is going to increase there. Good. And then release those and we'll just do a simple twist. So you're sitting up, you can take your left hand outside your right leg. Before you twist, lift up. So you've got a nice long spine to work with and then twist and maybe even look at the back of your chair. Inhaling, sitting up tall and exhaling, twisting around. And do one more like that. Use your eyes also. Look at the chair, loosen up your eyes. They get very stuck from looking at computers. And then face forward. The other side, so it's right hand outside the knee, sitting tall first before you make a move, and then twisting and looking over your left shoulder, breathing in and breathing out, and breathing in and breathing out. One more time. And face forward. Good. Yeah. Having done that, we're just going to do one more thing. Just hold your knees and pull on your knees to bring your rib cage forward and then tuck your navel in and round your back. These are little seated cat cows. So you can pull forward through your chest and then round your back and pulling forward. Good and rounding. And one more. Good. And then resting your hands along your legs. Just take a moment to stop. Let things settle. Let your body take in all of this interesting movement, learning, changing. Lift your inner gaze once more and bless your mind. And then bring one hand over the other on your heart and breathe a deep breath, bringing love and a deep blessing into your own heart. You'll carry it with you and it goes into the world and relax. Namaste. Thank you so much. I hope you're I hope, welcome. I hope everybody enjoyed that as even half as much as me, and I know it was great. And I just want to thank you for choosing those particular moods because that's something we can all do and 
you're so right about being hunched over and it, it just take what we did that for five, six minutes and look how much better I know I feel how much more open and you know, a lot of us on this live are over 50, even over 60, even closer to 70. And if we don't do, if we don't do this yoga, mind, body, yeah. spirit, breath, we're going to not be here as long as, as we could be. Yeah, we have a teacher with us, Emma Kaczynski, who's also a physical therapist, and she does um, recurring workshops, and she did one about bone strength in January, which was just brilliant, really wonderful. And she had this whole room of really older people who were there because they knew that they were in danger. Their bones had gotten fragile. And she was talking about her experience working with older people, especially. And she said, here's what she has observed. And she was very bold about it because mostly we don't talk about mortality, but she says, we're all going to die. We're yeah. all going to die. There is no question about it. You have to give this body back. And she says, you get to decide whether you want pretty much your body to stay as it is, the way you like it, the one that helps you to get things done in the world as long as you can, and then suddenly it's gone. Or whether you want to just bump along and get dragged and spend all your time at doctor's appointments and this and that all the way along and then have it end. And she said, you get to decide how you want to spend that time until you have to return the gift of the body. And I thought it was really wonderful. I mean, yoga just says... I'd like to be able to be here to appreciate, to um, to share with other people as long as I possibly can. And we're so fortunate we have yoga. It really, it really helps. It so helps. And I just, I just can't even begin to tell you how amazing a teacher you are. And I hope you do put this on your website and everybody in Weaverville, if they're not already signed up for your, your classes and we'll, we'll pop in that link again, how um, people can do these classes online. And even if you just do this with Barbara, it's so affordable to do these online classes. We do them live. That's something right. we got into during pandemic is that we didn't want to just abandon our students. Um, and the teachers all love teaching yoga. So we taught it to the camera and we kept going live and we have our own system now. So the classes are both in real time. I mean, that would be really early for some of you, but they're also recorded as videos right away. So they're in a library there that they can be accessed. But having them live in real time yeah. made a big difference just in the way that people felt like they couldn't drift. They couldn't go, oh, I'm going to do yoga and then never get around to it. It would be like nine o'clock. It's my time to do yoga. I'm flipping on the screen. My teacher knows I'm there because it's not Zoom. You can't see the person, but you'd see their name come on and the teacher would know, Donna, I'm so glad you're in class today. Right. And so it was right. just, um, it was a real lifeline for people. It kept them going. And we've, and we've kept doing it because we have a number of people who like to practice yoga with us and can't be in Weaverville to do it. So um, yeah, yeah. We, we do it both ways. I know. And I, I've met many of your teachers there. They're awesome. And it's such a great yeah, they're great. And no, no excuse, right, not to do it. And that's why I love doing these live shows. And I love a dose of positivity. Yeah. And, 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 and I just want to make a few quick announcements and then have you just come back because we, we're really past our time here. But I really want you to just to do a, a just share a little bit about you know, just yoga and tying it to nature and Buddha and the trees. But before you do that, um, because the closer we get to nature, right? Everybody knows, Mama Don always says this, the closer we get to our true nature. And that's what yoga has done for me. But um, I also, I just, I just want to remind everybody, um, you know, we are live and we are going to go off and anybody who wants to stay on afterwards and speak and meet Barbara and ask some questions, that's great. And, and to remind you, we're going to put the link in again for Tell's GoFundMe because there's a lot of new people in the group. And I want to, again, thank everybody for helping support Tell. Alan, you don't know this, but Tell's in the hospital in China, and she's fighting for her life right now. A lot of people know that, um, but not everybody. So, and I also want to say um, that our next guest next week is, is super cool. And, Barbara, you're going to love to meet her, and I think you guys um, would have a lot, in, uh, a lot to do to talk about i mean it would be super cool if she could come to north carolina and you could go to chicago and, and work with her she's that she's writing a new book right now um but she's a trigger therapist and she's going to take us through a series of it's it's kind of interesting it's kind of like almost like asanas but it's a body work thing and she talks just like you you know the pain center from here comes through your hands so anybody who's listening to this 
who wants to learn how to um, alleviate pain and stress in their bodies in, a, in a, another modality. Um, Sharon is going to be uh, teaching us a whole lot of things. And um, But one thing I'm going to also ask you to do for all of us, because we started out with how you got into yoga and your major epiphany, I, and, and I don't think you can stand on your desk, but maybe you can talk us through how to do this forward fold, because I think all of us could use a major transformation. Ah. I, I want to know <laughs> what the forward fold is, and then, then just leave us with a few words of wisdom about nature, Buddha, and the tree. That would be really, really appreciated. Right now, you want me to talk yeah, about right forward fold, just, Buddha, just, and just, nature? Just, okay. but, but show, and, and also show us the forward fold. And, forward um, fold is when you're standing, and your feet can be closer together hip distance or a little further apart and you just from the hip creases and you can actually even take your thumbs right now and glide them up your legs until that's not leg anymore you're in this little hinge point there yeah. that's it that's your hip crease so you can inhale and lift up out of there and then lean forward from there and you're going to feel your back open up and if you do that standing you fold over and the thing that happens and you'll see it in our classes people get panicky because they can't touch their toes but it's not actually about touching your toes it's about opening up your spine which you can't do if you're in a frantic state of struggling and trying to reach so if you get into a forward fold bend your knees bend your knees so you feel your tummy against your legs and your back has some place to go as it's relaxing and it will start to just soften up and melt and you'll feel it happening and it goes right through your neck and into your head you can even imagine the top of your head has a little hatch on it and it just slides over and all of that stuff that just seems so important and ubiquitous just drops right out and that's what happened with me with my teacher I just realized I don't I don't have to carry that it could just like fall and it yeah. did <laughs> I mean, it just <laughs> did just like a head rush. Well, that's good. Now I know forward pull is kind of like a forward bend, right? Like it's, it's just an asana. It's a forward bend, but don't bend yeah. from your waist because it will just make your low back unhappy. That's why you want your low back to be really soft and comfortable and cushioned by the front body as you fold over, so you can relax into it. It's about it's about really learning something about relaxing, and there's a pose that is right there to help us do it. And then before you go to, I'm going to ask you to put back. Mahu Baba, a link we couldn't find. Uh, hit, hit the girls didn't have to spell it. So I want to make sure people know. Uh, Can I do that here if I go to? Don't don't worry about it. We'll get. We'll make okay. sure we get it. So okay. so I'll nature Buddha you. the tree. Um, the, the yes, that's the, it. Have, Thank you. That's from Kayla. She wrote May her Baba. It's May her Baba. M -E -H -E. It means compassionate father. I love it. Yes. And the compassionate father knows the mother earth is what we need to nurture right now. So talk about how yoga and nature and the tree, because the symbol of your yoga studio is the tree too. How it about is. Bring, bring us all, close us out with a couple of words about that. And thank you. I just want to thank you so much. There's a wonderful mystic rabbi from Poland, Ukraine. His name was Rabbi Nachman and he lived in the 18th century. And he was just a honey, just a sweet guy. And he struggled with depression himself and he had tuberculosis and he had a family and he was a mystic. He was a complete mystic. And I think he would totally love reading some of what he says about how to pray. He says, go outside. He says, when you are outside, lift your hands, pray, open your heart, lift your face to the sky. He says, when you pray outside, the trees the grass, the flowers, all feel it happening and they pray with you and they're happy to have you lead them in prayer. I love that. Yeah. That is so beautiful and I'm so glad you brought a rabbi into the- Kayla, it's Nachman, N-A-C-H-M-A-N, N-A-C-H-M-A-N, yeah. rabbi, rabbi Nachman. He's wonderful. Yeah, I, I was asking that. that you, and he says, Kayla. let your faith, let your holiness extend into your hands. So when you lift them up like that, they're not just stuff that you, that you're, you know, kind of um, disrespectful of. You just think of them as like part of the, the package or something. They're really these lovely things like plants that you can lift up and raise up 
and they lift up what comes from your heart and they also just bring this energy from all the living things around you that is the human you really can influence you really do have an effect on them and lifting them up and lifting your heart is such a wonderful gift to everything around you ah, and with that i just want yeah. to thank you so much and, and and kayla if you can find rabbi and put his link in there because i definitely want to check out this dude who into nature and puts his hands up and it's, it's, it's. yeah I, I i love you so much i can hardly wait there's rabbi Nachman. we'll find we'll find a link and make sure we we provide that for everybody in the chat and also in the youtube replay so um i just want to thank you so much this was an incredibly relaxing and yet stimulating and um heartfelt just beautiful interview and i can hardly wait to see you at the weaverville studio in October. Um, you are my teacher. I love, I love your wisdom. I love your heart. I love your energy. I love your studio. And I love the other teachers who work at, um, who work with you at the Weaverville Yoga Studio. Thank you so much, Barbara. And You're everybody so showed up live. I thank you so much for being here and, and for all of you who are listening to the replay. And again, for all of you who have supported Tell during this journey and big, big love. And aloha. <laughs> <laughs>